Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. We are a ministry with the heart to see awakening in America. Today's message is, follow me. And now, here's Pastor Chris Dodge. Would you open your Bibles this morning, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. We're going to take a look at the story of the call of Matthew. It begins in chapter 9, verse 9 of the Gospel, and this is what we read. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Love those words. Love it as Jesus quotes from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus speaks those words twice. And what he is reminding people is what God desires above everything else is not that we go through the motions of worship, but rather that we show true faith by lives of humility, of humble obedience, of service, of mercy, of honoring God and blessing others. That's what Jesus is all about. And it's all summed up in this great account of Matthew. And we see him doing something absolutely remarkable here. Listen again to the way Matthew describes this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now, we have no knowledge of any prior contact between Jesus and Matthew. All we know from this gospel and the others is one day Jesus showed up at Matthew's tax collector's booth and said, follow me. And Matthew did. Now, you've got to realize what he left behind. First of all, the fact that Jesus would choose a tax collector to be one of his disciples. You know what the rabbis said? They ranked tax collectors right up there with murderers and thieves. Uh, They were considered traitors. They were also very wealthy because the the Romans had this horrible method of collecting taxes. If you think tax collecting in America is bad news, you should hear what it was like in ancient Rome. First of all, people bid for the right to collect taxes. And uh, what you did is you put in a bid for a particular area. If you won the bid... You had to make sure that you collected at least a certain amount to return to the government. But you now had government, the government seal of approval to collect whatever you could get just so long as you gave them what you had contracted to give them. You can imagine how that played to greed and graft and corruption. It's no wonder tax collectors were despised. But... They lived some very comfortable lives. And so what we have here this day is Jesus shows up at Matthew's tax collector's booth. And by the way, because of where Matthew was, he was up north in the city of Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was a great place to be a tax collector. If you wanted to collect the tax... This is the place to be. And now Matthew is seated right there along that major road. And so anything that came from the other side of the lake into the port at Capernaum got taxed. Matthew had it made in the shade. This is a guy whose retirement plan was in excellent shape and who was living the good life even though he was hated by everyone else. And what happens? Jesus shows up. All we're told is, Jesus said, follow me. And Matthew did. Wow. You know, he has not stopped saying that. He 
He still says, follow me. And he says it to the most unlikely of people. God is not a respecter of persons, the Bible declares. God does not see people the way human beings rate them. God wants them all. And to this day, Jesus is still speaking to his children and saying, follow me. It is absolutely radical. Do you know in all of the writings of the rabbis that we have, everything that has come down to us through the ages, through the Mishnah and the Talmud, and those things that have been preserved for hundreds and hundreds of years, there is nothing comparable that we have seen to the call of Jesus to follow him. That's not the way the rabbis did it. In fact, I'm going to put up on the screen the way the rabbis called people. Rabbinical training. First of all, the rabbi didn't ask someone to follow him. People asked if they could follow the rabbi. And in rabbinical training, the student had to take the initiative and prove that he was worthy to follow the rabbi. That's the way it was always done. That's what we know. That's what has been passed down to us. It's the student who has to ask, not the rabbi. On top of that, when a student was chosen and selected because he had made a good offer and he looked like a promising candidate, he had to swear allegiance to the Torah, to the scriptures, to the word of God handed down through Moses and the prophets. And then he committed himself to follow the ways and statutes of God. Even if you look in the scriptures, you know, in the, the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, we do not have examples of any individual saying, follow me. Instead, we have examples of people saying, I, I will follow your ways, O Lord. I will walk in your statutes. I will abide by your teachings. Jesus is so radical. Instead of asking us to apply, he personally engages us and says, follow me. Instead of pledging allegiance to a document, he calls us to pledge allegiance to him. I pledge allegiance to the lamb with all I have and with all I am. And more than that, he simply says to us, not simply walk in all of the ways that are laid down here, but rather walk in my way. Follow me. It is personal. It is powerful. It is life transforming. It is the way of God, the way of Jesus. And it's a reminder that even though the story is about Matthew, the central character is Jesus. <laughs> and look what happens. Matthew leaves it all. And then what does he do? Does he sit back and say, okay, well, I'm just going to sit around now and wait for Jesus to return? No, he wants everybody else to know him. Matthew understands that once you've come to know Jesus, you do not want to go to heaven alone. It's just that simple. You know, God's children, we do not want to be the only ones there. That's not the way God intends it. What he intends is that all of his children come back to him. That the nations bow before him. That the world know he is God. He has redeemed us. He has paid the ultimate price by offering up his own blood in our behalf. That's what changes all. And that's what changed Matthew. And so after Matthew had been called by Jesus to follow him, Matthew throws a party. And who does he invite? Fellow scum. <laughs> I, I mean, that's what it is. Look, look at what it says here. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him. Who does Jesus hang out with? With the high and mighty who are proud and really, really think they are the bee's knees and they are God's answer to humanity and we've got it all. And No, Jesus hangs around with tax collectors and sinners, with prostitutes and with individuals who have wandered away from the living God. Because he wants them all. And he wants us back. And Matthew invites his friends. 
Matthew does not say, look at what I've accomplished. He says, I want you to meet Jesus. I want you to meet Jesus. It's just that simple. And isn't that our heart's desire? When we know him, when we understand how much he loves us, when we understand just how much people mean to God, we want everyone to know that. And that was Matthew's heart. I'll be real honest with you. We don't know much more about Matthew from the Bible. What we know from early Christians is that he wrote the gospel. In fact, the earliest testimony tells us that he originally wrote it in the Hebrew language. What we have is the Greek. But Matthew, according to the earliest believers, was the first gospel to be written. I know that today many disagree with that, but I personally happen to believe that those early first and second century believers probably knew a little more than I do. And so I'm going to accept their testimony. But beyond that, we just don't know much about Matthew. He's not mentioned in any detail in the, the rest of the Gospels. He, he is not described and his work isn't recorded in the book of Acts. But one thing we do know, he followed Jesus and he went where Jesus told him. And he was willing, he was willing to give it all up because he understood that knowing Christ is more than anything this world has to offer. Today, many people look at God's call and they say, but, oh, but if I follow him, what might that mean? And what Matthew knew is, it's worth giving up your career to live forever. What Matthew knew is, it's worth risking your future to have a future that never ends. What Matthew understood is, it is worth following one who loves me enough to die for me and will never leave me and never forsake me. And that's who Jesus is. And that's why his call is so compelling and so powerful. He just simply says, follow me, follow me. And so we read this then. While Jesus is dining at Matthew's house and the tax collectors and sinners are eating with him and his disciples, the Pharisees, good religious people, you know, I, I mean, the, the high and mighty of the church going cloud, they begin asking the disciples. I find it rather interesting. They don't ask the question of Jesus. They ask the question of his disciples. Because you see what the enemy always desires to do is sow discord. He loves to spread lies. And he loves to try to undermine the children of God. And so the Pharisees, they go to the disciples, not to Jesus. They go to the disciples and say, I quote, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. You know, who's this guy you're following? Why, why are you doing these things? Who do you think you are and who does he think he is? I'll tell you who he know he is. <laughs> he is the living God come to earth. He is the mercy of the heavenly father incarnate in his beloved son who has come to redeem a sinful and fallen world. He is the one who loves his children and wants them all back. He is the one who calls to the weak and the broken, to those who are desperate and says, I love you, now follow me. And so when the word gets back to Jesus, here's what he says. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Jesus said, I've come to help the sick. Now there is, there is an incredible rebuke there. Because the Pharisees, they think they're the healthiest of the healthiest. You know, and that is always true of those who are living for religion rather than living in a relationship with God. They are always proud and haughty. They always look down on others. They are the ones who, as Jesus described in one of his great parables, go into the temple and say, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like these other scum. Yeah. And Jesus says, I've come to minister to the sick. But with that is the acknowledgement 
of these people, they don't even realize how desperate their situation is. Because you see, only God can convict the heart. Only God can reveal what is hidden. Only God can speak to the depth of the soul. And God comes to those who know how much they need him. And Jesus appears to those whom the world may look down on, but whom God treasures greatly. And so Jesus then quotes the scripture. He says to these religious hypocrites, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Because you see, that's what God said through the prophet Hosea. Here is all of Hosea 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. What God says is, I don't want lip service. I want true service. I don't want you to go through the motions. I desire that you follow me. What God desires is not simply that we hang a Christian shingle in our houses, but rather that we follow the one who hung on a cross for us and who's risen from the grave. And that, my dear friends, is at the heart of Matthew's story. Because to this day, Jesus is still calling people like you and me to a relationship with him, to follow him. He's calling us to far more than religious acknowledgement of a simple biblical truth. He is calling us to humble adoration of one who is the way and the truth and the life. And if Jesus is the way, if he is the road to the Father, then we want to follow him. It's just that simple. And God is desiring to this day to summon people to himself and to call us into a relationship with him that will last forever. And so I ask you, what about you? What about you in your life? Are you ready to heed his call? He spoke to Matthew 2,000 years ago on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. But he is still engaging individuals like you and me today. And every day he is saying to us, follow me. What about you? Are you following? Will you follow? Perhaps you're one who has acknowledged God and an individual who has said, you know, I know he's real. I know he's genuine. I believe he died for me on the cross. But you've resisted following him in your life. And perhaps it's been for a wide variety of reasons. Maybe because, maybe because you feel that you have messed up so badly that he'd never be able to use you and he doesn't have the power to turn your life around. That's a lie. He has the power to turn any life around. And he can take a greedy, self-absorbed tax collector and turn him into a missionary and an apostle. Believe me, if he can do that to Matthew, he can handle you and me. Maybe you're saying... I'm reluctant to follow because I'm afraid of what it might cost me. I would plead with you, dear friend. Don't go down that road. Because you see, there will come a day when everyone will acknowledge Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But we do not want to spend eternity in eternal regret. What God is saying is, Follow me now. As an act of faith, yield yourself to me and just watch what I will do. He does not make any false promises. In fact, he is very upfront with his disciples. He told them the days are coming. You need to know this. The days are coming when people will hate you because you bear my name. The days are coming when you will be brought before courts and before kings and held to account because you follow me. 
He said, the days are coming when people will think that in killing you, they are serving God. Jesus says, the days are coming when you, many of you, will die for me. He does not give false promises. He only speaks the truth. But here's the rest of what he says. Everyone who believes in me has already passed from death to life. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Everyone who follows me and dies to self will live for all eternity. Everyone who follows my lead and follows and surrenders all to me, I will give them all forever. That is the gospel truth. And that is worth dying for, much less living for. Many times people say, well, if it ever came down to it, I'd be willing to die for him. And what he's saying to us today is, I want you to live for me now. And I want you to follow me. And he does that not so that we earn something. He does it because he loves us. And he wants every one of us to experience the joy of knowing him personally. Of seeing him move and work in our lives. Of seeing him in the joyful days, but also in the difficult days. Being so incredibly faithful. Protecting preserving and upholding us. He desires that we experience the fullness of His Holy Spirit so that our hearts are renewed and transformed. He desires that we experience the full baptism of the Spirit of the living God, that we may say no to those things that have chained us in for so long and say, yes, God, I will go where you desire me to go. And in your strength, I will rise above the garbage to live for you. And I will demonstrate by my life that you are who you claim to be and you will demonstrate in my life your great and mighty power. And I receive that and I rejoice in that. That is his plan for each and every one of us. It is not simple acknowledgement that there is a God. It is acknowledgement. Jesus is my savior. He died for me. And I will give my life for him because he is also my Lord. And I will follow him because, well, let's put it this way. The retirement plan is out of this world. Yeah. And that's what God offers us. Life with him forever. A new creation that is already beginning in those who follow him. The Apostle Paul put it so clearly. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The new creation has come and God desires to recreate us each day. He can do this. He will do this. He calls us simply to follow one step at a time. Matthew walked away from the tax booth and walked with Jesus. I don't know about you. I want to do the same thing. I want to follow him wherever he goes and wherever he leads. Because I know that in the end, he's going to win. <laughs> it's just that simple. In the end, he's going to win. And so will we as we live by faith and follow him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? And let's make this quiet but personal. As you reflect on Matthew's story, as you reflect on Jesus' call, what is God saying to you this morning? Would you just take a moment to talk with him and share with him what he has placed on your heart? You've been listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. We hope you will take some personal time with God in prayer today. If you would like prayer, reach out to us at Awake Us Now. Our phone number is 612-545-5654. 612-545-5654. 
We have prayer warriors ready to pray with you. Thanks so much for listening in today. Join us again tomorrow.